So we're going to start now with a follow-up lecture. We last time looked at the idea of taking time series data from some dynamical system and doing a regression to discover the governing equations which created that. So it's a process by which you can take time series data and discovering the underlying dynamical system that produced it. So it's an important piece for us in the data-driven world now where we have the ability to collect lots of data and what we'd really like to do is understand fundamentally what was the process or was the dynamical system that produced it. And so this is a, a new architecture, a new take on what we can do uh, using data science techniques uh, over in the realm of our traditional modeling where, especially to systems where we don't necessarily know the underlying governing equations. Now we're going to generalize this idea to think about more broadly some PDE-based systems. Okay? So now what we're looking at is, uh, oh, the orange doesn't quite come through as well, but now what we're looking at is trying to discover some spatial temporal system. So U lives on some spatial domain. It's changing in time. It's changing in space. And there's some nonlinear governing equation that would dic dictate the evolution. It could be linear, of course. So for instance, we typically solve a lot of partial differential equations, Maxwell's equations, Schrodinger's equations, and then there's a whole slew of nonlinear equations, like some of these reaction diffusion systems, Berger's equations, uh, Kermode-Shivashinsky. There's, uh, for any kind of scientific application, we have spatial temporal dynamics. We would prescribe some evolution equation like this and then actually try to go about and solve this. And there's a lot of different ways to numerically discretize this and then evolve this thing forward into the time. But the problem is, in our case, we don't know what n is. So we're going to take a system, we measure it, and we would like to extract some kind of n that is actually the right type of model for the system we're measuring. So we're going to make some kind of parsimonious model representation. So the claim here, of course, is that just like last time, all this is going to lead to is solving ax equal to b. That's what we said last time, which is just, well, you just turn this into a, just a giant linear system of equations. Uh, sorry, sorry uh, you, you build a library and you do a linear regression to solve for the terms that most likely represent the dynamics. As before, what we're going to do is say, if I give you u, so, right, let's give you a time series. So given u, so I have snapshots at spatial locations, then from that, I can compute u dot, so, or ut, however you would like to call it. So I can compute the time derivative. So I know now the left side. That was my b. So ax equal to b, u dot is going to be the b. I get it from computing time derivatives of u. Okay? Everything's following exactly like what we did for the od case so far. But now, when we build our library of terms, The library itself can now have terms which depend upon derivatives, spatial derivatives. So for instance, you could say my library depends on u. And remember, u is some giant vector snapshots in time. Or it could depend upon ux, u squared, ux, uxx, so forth. And remember, the library is just up to your imagination. You can put in lots of candidate functions in there. Okay? Now, this is going to be a lot bigger than before. Remember this U state, when we did this for trying to find Lorenz, is a three by three system. So we, what we had is three time series, right, for X, Y, and Z. But now, if I'm solving it on a grid of spatial domain, I may have, let's say if I, if I discretize this 100 by 100 points, then I'm going to have a lot of points, right? I'm going to have 100 squared. So we're going to have a 10,000 
degree vector. So each snapshot of time will have 10,000 components. And I stack these. So I look at the state of the system at time t, t plus delta t, t plus 2 delta t, and so forth. So that's going to be a really long uh, matrix. Okay. So again, this, this matrix generically is going to be tall and skinny. Okay. So those are my library candidate functions. So that's going to be my matrix A. So I have A is this guy, B is this guy. All I got to find is X. And what is X? X tells me the weight of each one of these so that when I multiply by this, I get to U dot, right? So I take A times X is equal to B. In other words, these libraries times some weight is equal to U dot. So it's written in this form here. And what I believe is only a few of those terms matter. Okay, so this vector that we're going to get out, x, which is the loadings of these, should be sparse. That's it. Ax equals to b for a very large overdetermined system. Find the regressive solution for this linear regression. Promote sparsity. So that's it. And all I've done differently from the, the first lecture is I've allowed the library now to have spatial derivatives. Okay? So what I want to do is just illustrate this with an example. I'm going to basically solve Berger's equation. And we're going to evolve that equation. And then I'm going to just give you the data. And from the data, I'm going to ask, could you have discovered that it was Berger's that produced that data? So that's going to be the goal for the rest of the lecture is to code this up. All we're doing is solving ax equal to b. So don't make this any fancier than it is. Solve ax equal to b. Get the solution that promotes sparsity. Now, in this code, we're going to have very nice data. It's going to be pretty clean. My only comment is going to be, in practice, what you'd want to do is to make sure you have good differentiation routines, finite differences, in general, are not going to be sufficient to do a good job, especially if you have noise. So I will, of course, show you with finite differences right now with this code, but there are better ways to do it. And in fact, if you look at the course website, so on the YouTube here, there's a link to the course website. You'll see I have some supplementary lectures there, one of them by Sam Rudy, who basically was the first to really do this regression to discover PDEs. He has some very nice uh, references to differentiation routines, as well as code implementation you can just download. So you just run that. You can find yourself much better differentiation routines. So that if you go to do real data in practice, you have much better uh, tools available for you to do differentiation. OK, so let's go and solve this. And here we go. Oops. Get this up here. All right. So I'm going to solve Berger's equation. So I've already pre-written these codes so we can walk through, take a little more time to explain this versus programming directly here, which I've normally been doing. So here's Berger's equations. ut plus uux minus some epsilon uxx. So this is a diffusion term. And uux is sort of a nonlinear advection. Okay, so this equation is fairly famous because originally when people were looking at this, they were thinking about ut, ux, so one-way waves. But what you notice about nonlinear waves is nonlinear waves, you can just go to the beach and notice this, is that the top of the wave moves faster than the bottom of the wave. That's why it curls over and breaks. So what people started modeling this is with ut plus uux. So the speed depends on the amplitude. Now, what ends up happening is when this thing breaks, you no longer have a solution. But of course, people uh, know that waves actually, you're just missing physics at that point when gradients become very sharp. One way to regularize the burgers is to regularize it with a little bit of diffusion. So as this thing starts to steepen, diffusion becomes more important and it arrests the breaking of the wave. Okay, so it's a, it's a very nice toy model to illustrate some nice physical concepts that we know have to hold. So here's where I'm going to solve it. We're going to take time steps of point 0.1. This is going to be my data sampling. 
I'm going to run this from time 0 to 10, steps of dt. I'm going to pick this diffusion regularization to be 0.1, so just a little bit of diffusion. My domain size is going to be 16, and I'm chopping it up into 256 points. Okay, so that's my spatial discretization. And I'm going to solve this with an FFT method. And uh, so if you're not familiar with this, I have some other lectures on another course for this you can follow up on. So my domain is just guys from, goes to linear space, goes from ne negative L over 2 to L over 2. So it goes from negative 8 to 8 in n plus 1 points. Since I'm using Fourier domains, the last point is the same as the first. So I discretize it into 257 points and I remove the last point. So my domain x is all but the very last point, which is the same as the first point. Okay? Once I have that discretization, let's, let's bring this over here. I can also then say, well, given the discretization, what are the Fourier modes I need to start considering and what are their wave numbers? So here they are. 2 pi over L, this is a normalization. The FFT thinks you're working on a 2 pi periodic domain. So the 2 pi over L is a normalization that tells me, well, I'm actually working on a domain of size 16. I've normalized it down to a size of 2 pi. And here are the wave numbers. So these are things like cosine 0x, cosine 1x, two, cosine 2x, and sine 1x, sine 2x, so forth. Okay. Now in the FFT domain, these are shifted. So K2 is representative of them in the unshifted domain. All right. I'm going to go ahead and take an initial condition, which is a Gaussian. Here it is, centered, right, at minus 2. And I'm going to evolve this thing. So first I take this, I Fourier transform it, and in the Fourier domain, I'm going to evolve the Berger's equation. And when I come out with the solution, I'm going to go ahead and pull row by row, which is the time snapshot, to bring it back from the Fourier domain to the real domain, and then I'm going to plot them. Okay, I'm going to plot the slices of what this Berger's equation looks like. Now let me show you what the right-hand side looks like for Berger's. Here it is, right-hand side of Berger's. You come in, you send in your initial data and your time. First thing you need to do to be able to compute that nonlinear term is you need to first bring it back to the real domain. So you IFFT it, U0. You can calculate one derivative of U0, which here's the derivative formula. You multiply by IK in the Fourier domain and you inverse Fourier transform. So your right-hand side is your diffusion term, negative k squared u naught t minus the Fourier transform of the nonlinear term, which is u ux. So this is it. So all this code is here. It's on the website. You can run this. And the main thing is, I know what the governing equation is. And regardless if you're interested in the PD solves or not, the, the main idea is I'm going to run this, produce data, and then I'm going to try to do this regression procedures to see if I can, in fact, recover the Berger's equation. Okay? So let's run it and see what the solutions look like. So when you run it, here we go. I'm going to give you one figure. And we can start rotating this around. So what you see here, right, is a Gaussian that initially starts to move to the right. That's the advection. And you can see that it starts to, the top is moving faster than the low amplitude portions. That's why you're getting this sharp edged asymmetric profile. So the top's moving faster, so this thing's starting to curl over. And of course, diffusion arrests that. So that's the basic evolution dynamics of Berger's with this starting initial condition, um, which is a Gaussian. So you see, here's the profile. Right? So it's got this refraction type structure on the back end, and then you get this sharpening, which is a shock type structure. But it's regularized, so you don't get an actual shock. It's just a sharp structure front that keeps moving along. OK. So that's going to produce data for us. This is our, our data that we want to now use to discover PDEs. So let's go look at what the data did. I have actually saved this here with this command, save the burgers data, and the x and the t in the solution. So I have all that. You could save it. In other words, run these PDs, have the data. And then now, 
the next step is to ingest that data and to start to do this construction of an ax equal to b problem. Remember, that's all we're going to do is ax equal to b. Um, and we're going to find that we can actually recover this pretty nicely. Okay, so let me put this one down and let me go now go to the PDE find. So I'm going to walk through this code and it's going to have several pieces. All we're intending to do in this code here is to create a couple things. First, we need to remember everything's going to be framed as ax equal to b. For me to construct the b matrix, I have to compute the time derivative of the state of the system. And then if I want to constru construct the a matrix, I have to construct libraries of potential functions, but now they include spa spatial derivatives. So I have to have a way to take this state of the system, differentiated in time, and differentiated in space, so I can construct libraries, and I construct, that's the A matrix, and construct time dynamics, which is the B, and then all I have to do, what we did last time, we're going to start off with just backslash. It's AX equal to B, backslash, see what you get. Okay? And remember, for these very large overdetermined systems, the, what backslash does is it implements a QR to get you a solution, so it gives you actually back something sparse. And the question is, that sparse solution, what does it tell us about the data itself? Okay, so things I need. I need the time step. dt is t2 minus t1. Okay, so in other words, that's the, that's the distance between snapshots. Okay, x is going to be my data, the real part of u sol. Now, the Burger's equation is real, but because I use the Fourier transform to solve it, right, there's a little bit of numerical round off, which is imaginary numbers. So I'm going to get rid of them. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm just going to bring it back to real data, and I just show you what the real data looks like. It's that wave curling over. Okay, and so now it's a pretty big matrix, right? Because I have 256 points plus quite a number of snapshots in time. Okay, so that's that's my data matrix. In fact, the size of this I can just get m by n is the size of x. So that'll tell me the number of snapshots I have as well as n, which is the number of spatial points. So n is 256. M is we ran this thing up to time 10, I believe. Let's just double check what we were doing here. So what we had done is we ran this from time 0 to time 10, steps of 0.1, right? So we have something like 101 snapshots, okay? So you have a matrix that has 101 snapshots and 256 spatial locations. That's your data matrix you're going to start with. Okay, so what am I going to do with this? Well, the first thing to do is to produce the right-hand side. AX equal to B. The B itself was the time derivatives. So I'm going to take this X dot, and what I'm going to do is compute derivatives. So I'm going to do a double loop. Remember this matrix now. So remember what we did before with the Lorenz. We just took, like, if I have the X series, I just differentiated it in time. And then I did it for Y and Z. But now I've got to do it for every single spatial location. Okay? So the outside of the loop is this JJ loop, which goes from 1 to M. Walk through space. And in this case here, M actually is the 256. So I'm going to go through the loop 256 times, one for every spatial location I have. Okay? So for every spatial location in time, I'm going to compute its derivative. 256 space points, that means I need 256 time derivatives. And I have 100 points in space time, so then I'm going to compute using my finite difference. This is what we did before. Walk through time, I'm going to use a center difference formula. So if I want to know what my time derivative at a certain point, I look at the point in front of me, I look at the point behind me, rise, overrun. So those two difference of those two points divided by 2 dt. And here it is. So x dot for the j j row and j minus 1. So I'm not going to consider the first and last points. Remember, I could if I wanted to, but if I'm using center difference, the first point has no neighbor, has no past, and the last point has no future. So I can't use the center difference. So I just say, well, just look at the interior points. 
from the second dt all the way to next to the last dt. So then I make this matrix a x dot. This is going to be my right hand side b is equal to point in front j plus 1 in time, point behind in time j minus 1 for each jj, for each spatial point, divided by 2 delta t. I walk through this loop. x dot now has for me the time derivatives. Okay? For every single point. It's kind of as simple as that. Of course, if you get very large systems, right, this is a lot. So if I'm solving, if I have a very large domain and I've discretized into 1,000 points one direction, 1,000 points the other direction, now I'm going to have to find, you know, this is now a million points. I have to go and compute the time derivatives for all a million. And if I have a very long time differentiation with a large space, this can be very costly. Okay? But there are subsampling techniques. And again, that's addressed in the actual paper where uh, this PDE find methodology was developed. Okay, but not too big here. Now the other thing we have to do is decide we want to compute derivatives, right? So now we're regressing not just to some right-hand side that looks like anything. I want my right-hand side to have terms like u, ux u, uxx, ux squared, things like this, right? So if I'm going to compute space derivatives, I'm going to do it very much like I do time derivatives. I'm going to use center difference. But I can take an entire state of the system and multiply by a matrix that would differentiate it. Okay, so finite difference differentiation really is equivalent to a matrix multiply. And what do those matrices, matrices look like? Well, here's the structure. Let me tell you, first of all, I need dx. Okay, and the way that dx is going to tell me, just like dt told me how to do the center difference formula, dx is going to do the same thing for me here. So d, first of all, is going to be the first derivative matrix. I'm going to load it with zeros. It's an m by m. Remember, I have 256 points. The D matrix is going to multiply to 256 by 256, multiplying this matrix to give me an approximation to the derivative. Okay? D2 will be an approximation to the second derivative. And differentiation matrices come like this. A first derivative has this kind of structure here. One on the off diagonals minus one on the off diagonals in the other direction. So it's a tridiagonal matrix with zeros down the middle. On the upper triagonal, it's one. The bottom diagonal is negative one. This corresponds to taking your two neighbors, this point minus this point, divide by two delta x. Okay? So I use those neighboring points to compute my spatial derivative. A second derivative has one on the off diagonals, negative two down the diagonals. And this all comes from just finite difference discretization of derivatives. Okay? I'm assuming you know that. If not, there's some background material that you can link to on the page to get that. Okay? So that's during the interior, all down the middle. But then on the edges, because we have periodic boundary conditions, I put periodic boundary conditions here, which is the ones off the diagonal, the one on the top diagonal is a one on this side, negative one on the top will come over to a negative one here. So this gives you a periodic differentiation divide by 2 delta x. So this matrix D here is a differentiation matrix which is enforcing periodic boundaries, which is exactly what we have. We have Berger's equation that we've solved it on periodic domain. So this is a first derivative on that periodic domain. D2 here, remember I walked all the way down except for the last diagonal to put these in because I went from 1 to m minus 1 and then I have to finish off the d2 matrix by at the last diagonal put negative 2 and on the corners put 1's to make it periodic divide by dx squared in this case for the second derivative and now I have d2. So d and d2 a first derivative or a second derivative. So I can take my vector u, which is the solution of Burgers, hit it with this d matrix, and it's, what will come out is the a, a, a first derivative. I hit it with d2, what will come out as the second derivative. Kind of as easy as that. And so again, this is using basic scientific computing numerical differentiation schemes that have been around forever. Okay? But now we're leveraging them here to compute libraries for the right-hand side. Now what I'm going to do is start setting up my library. So here it is. 
my library structure, um, sorry, I'm going to take my U, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start, I'm going to reshape this thing. Okay? So remember, the U matrix is all the space points, but all the time points, too. And what I want to do is line up in a column, if I want to look at the, what U is looking like, U is going to be a column of this full solution at time t, full solution at t plus delta t. In other words, stacked on top of each other are the different time points. Okay? So that's what I'm doing here. I'm taking my data matrix X, and I'm going to throw away the first and last point because I only have the, I remember when I did my differentiation, I just did it for the interior points. I could always differentiate the last points, but for convenience, I don't do it here. I just look at the interior points and I say, look, I'm going to take this, I'm going to take this pile of data, reshape it all to one big long vector. Remember, my matrix of, of that, the library is the different terms in the columns, time goes down the rows. That's what I just did here. Make time go down the rows. Okay? So I do that. So I go reshape the data. That is U. Now, what I can do to compute, like for instance, a first derivative, second derivative, first derivative squared, which are these things here, is I'm going to compute some objects, which is I'm going to go through and I'm going to take, run through this thing for the different time points, and u of x is going to go hit different portions of the data. So I'm going to take, for instance, take the whole state of the system at one time, hit it with d, that's one derivative, do it again for the next delta t if later, that's the derivative at delta t, take it again at 2 delta t and so forth, and that's what I'm doing here. I'm going to walk through all the data points from 2 to n minus 1, and I'm going to differentiate them. And then I'm going to just stack them into some giant matrix, just like I did here. I mean some giant vector, just like I did here. So I have the solution u, and I have u of x at time t, at time t plus delta t, t plus 2 delta t, and so forth. I do the same thing for uxx, and here, this is the derivative of u squared x. That's what this is here. Okay, I'm just making these up. I just said this is how you might do this. Here's some simple ones. So now I have ux, uxx, u squared x. You can make as many as you want in there. Okay? And after I've hit them, sorry, I didn't reshape them yet. Then I reshape them. So everybody's some long, tall matrix, vector, that I'm going to put in as my library. And here are my library candidates. Just make this up. A is equal to, well, maybe it depends on you. Maybe it depends on u squared, u cubed, ux, uxx, u squared x, ux u, ux times ux. So ux squared, ux times uxx. Put in as many terms as you want in there. Remember, the library is only constrained by your imagination. I just made this here just for example. And the question is, if I have this, I'm going to do the regression now. I'm set. I have the matrix A. I have the right-hand side B. So I have A and B. So all I have to do is find X. Okay? So first of all, the matrix B U dot is equal to, I reshape the X dot again to some long vector. And here's some options for you. I did two of them. Let's just first do backslash. Okay? So what I'm going to do is say my solution, C, the loadings of the coefficients will just be, you know, A backslash B. Simple as that. Now what I've advocated is that's all we were trying to set up is an AX equal to B problem. And the question is, what do I get out? Okay? And what I'm going to look out here for is I'm going to do this and I'm going to do a bar graphic C and see which ones of these terms, what, what, what sort of coefficient do they have in front of them when I do this regression. Okay? So let me uh, do this so I can just put those there. I'm going to run this. And you're going to see is this is what's going to come out. All right. So it's very fast. And let's look at the terms that it's picking up. Okay, so first of all, you can see, actually, there's a number of terms here floating around. 
So this is the first term, which is u here. Second term, u squared, u cubed. Doesn't say there's anything with ux. Here's a uxx term. Okay, that's interesting. That's one that we know we should have. This is the u squared x term. Oh, look at this, ux, u. That's the term we had knew Burgers has to have, right? Uh, it's not there, but let, we'll come back to that in a second. And these other terms. So there's two dominant terms. Let's just say that. No, normally what you would do is you do a thresholding. And that's what we talked about last time is if you look here, actually, and you look, zoom in down here, nobody's actually zero, right? So let me just, in fact, directly show you this. So if you look down here, nobody's zero. And in fact, I zoom in more. There's some coefficient here. So nobody's zero, but there's some clear dominant terms. Two of them. This guy and this guy. So the first term we get, let's write down the equation that this thing seems to be giving us. Here's what it is. Seems to say ut is equal to. Now what we have here is a uxx term. And what's the coefficient? I don't know if you can read this, but this is 0.1. Okay. 0.1 uxx. Maybe space that out a little bit so it's not quite as. Okay, that's the first term we get. And then we have this term here, which seems to have a strength, if you can see here, it's negative 0.5. Okay, minus 0.5. That. So first of all, at first blush, you'd say, okay, those are the dominant terms, but where's my other burger term? Well, just do this differentiation. Take the x derivative of this, right? Then that 2 comes down, you get minus 2 came down, u, ux. There's my burgers. That's exactly what I put in. And you can see those are the dominant terms. Now, this term, unlike the, what we did with the Lorenz, these aren't as small as they were when I did the Lorenz example, but still, my dominant terms, I nailed it. I got burgers back in some ways. If I threshold hard, then I would say I've discovered burgers. Okay? So uh, I would say we have a success here. And you can decide to threshold it. The other thing you can do instead of thresholding harder, you can say like, okay, well, since it's not promoting sparsity as much as I'd like, let's go ahead and come down to here. And let's go ahead and say, all right, let's do the lasso. So lasso is just another way to solve AX equal to B. But now it specifically does an L1 penalty on the solution, promoting sparsity of your solution that comes out. Okay? And you can promote sparsity with some value lambda. There's a, there's a toggle switch that tells you how much sparsity you want to promote. So let's just go ahead and run it, see what we get here. And very different result. So again, uh, what you find is you get your, let's, let's look at this. Now, in promoting this sparsity, it says that the fourth term starts to really come on, one, two, three, four. So it's really giving us a UX signature, okay? So when you pro do this last so, the UX comes on, we still have the two other right terms, it's just that this gets a lot of loading. But the results change significantly as you start playing around with this sparsity promotion, okay? I think I just ran it again. There, let's do that. Maybe it's taking a while. So, so there's some fiddling here and tuning that has to happen. Uh, you have to tune it both if you use a least square threshold regression. In other words, you do least squares, which is very fast. You can see this is actually taking a while to run because it's actually doing an L1 optimization. Um, but you either tune it through this uh, parameter lambda or in the thresholding, you tune where you're going to threshold. In either case, all these methods have tuning. And one thing that I'll say generically is all the machine learning methods we think about, whether it's deep neural nets or these kind of regression techniques, they all have tuning parameters. So this is a fact of life you're going to have to live with. It's not like you can get away with it. There may be a way to cross-validate that tuning so you can sort of have a more principled way to pick out values, 
But for the most part, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, that promoted too much sparsity. Sorry, the, the result was always there. So if I really raise the sparsity promotion, it says everybody goes away. So let's try to do something more, not quite as harsh. Okay. So, all right. So you can see, start seeing lasso itself really gives you very different results as you change that parameter. Uh, let's go even further down then. We had 0.1 was not bad. Let's do cut that in half. Okay, now you start seeing, now you're getting out what you need. Now we're promoting sparsity to a level like the two terms dominate. This thing's going away. Let's just make, go even further down. Look at that. So now we're, we're really getting the highlights of what we have. So whether you use lasso, a P inverse, in some sense it might not matter. But the main point is this, final thoughts. If you have spatial temporal data, it's no different than if I have those ODEs. You take the time series, you're going to have to differentiate the time series. But now your library is going to include a bunch of terms that are going to be u, ux, u squared x, uxx, so forth. You, you, you start to diversify your library to include spatial derivatives. It's the same ax equal to b problem that we had previously, though. You're going to do ax equal to b, promote sparsity for the solution. And the other thing that I would say is that PDEs now are very high dimensional systems. So your AX equal to Bs are going to be much bigger than they were in the OD case. Okay, so that's it. There's only one other thing left to talk about, which is if I don't have measurements of all the full state, what do I do? Uh, and we'll talk about time delay embeddings to get some things there.